Right, should be going. Perfect, and then three, two, one, recording. People, after a bit of, uh, can I say actually mess or this bad thing, we finally started recording and somebody else here started recording from the video. So we have a couple of stuff recording at the moment, but everybody, welcome to Caravan Sarai, episode two. And uh, we're going to talk about Atlas Mountain Race. And we messed up with technology, and I'm here together with Becky. Hey guys, I uh, feel like I need to make a public apology for having a shoddy Wi-Fi connection, which is why this hasn't gone to plan. Um, so the absence of the live YouTube is my fault. But you still get our voices, which is pretty great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can say actually then we can call Becky the, co the root cause of all the problems. <laughs> all the problems all, all the, the problems. problems that's me that's me <laughs> and then together with uh, Becky I there's also Josh that actually is a phase that now you should be used to it uh, used to because I mean your live there on YouTube was quite I would say that was cracking the internet quite a bit uh, yeah maybe um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure but uh, people was, were quite interested in, in my sort of daily reports so um, yeah, I think it, it helps put a bit of life to the the dots on the map. Um, and I kind of knew about the race, so it was quite nice just to talk about about something that I couldn't do. So it was a, a personal thing as well. And yeah, now we so get to talk about it all over again. Yeah, exactly. Now we start again talking about actually something that we know how to do and something that we know how to do, especially Becky watching some dots and me talking about stuff that I don't know what, because actually I didn't start the so much before this recording so let's see what is coming but actually when i was saying cracking the internet probably you are also one of the causes of why the internet didn't work today josh so yeah gets okay. your part of blame as well <laughs> so uh, i will start actually with the best things and the things that really uh, people together with me me included can do really good so atlas monterey's everything finished end of last week beginning of this week i don't remember but then people you too now you're gonna say the podium of the race plus the podium of the women's race and we're gonna also talk about a bit the pairs you decide who is gonna say and pronounce the names of the winners and everything you decide who. shock on the women Josh, you can have a. Oh, actually, no, your favorite rider scratched, didn't he? So you don't have to say his Mateo. name until later in the podcast. <laughs> okay, okay. Mateo, that's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, um, that's something that people you should know a bit. So basically, while um, Josh was uh, making his life super helpful and everything, and messing up with the name of Mattia, Mattia, uh, I was sending him <laughs> daily voice messages. Most of the time from my indoor training, so in trainer, so probably not the sound was not the best, the best, sending him messages by saying, Josh, Mattia De Marchi. Mattia. You weren't you were the only one, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> and I still next time, I'm not time. But, uh, but, uh, like, next time I'm not gonna do it. Okay, I could take actually then the risk responsibilities because anyways, uh, I'm in front of the big microphone so I can do it. So Robin Gemperle, how does it sound? Gemperle, Gemper, I mean. Yeah, I think that was correct. I, I did get corrected on that one as well. great when you say Stefano. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, uh, here I can see the, the Swiss flag. So I don't know actually Gemperle, Gemperle. Gemperle. If it's the French side for sure, it's even Robin. Could be actually the German side, or maybe it's uh, Romanche, this could be. Second, Justinas, uh, Justinas, or just J Justinas, probably is Leveka, Leveka. And then third, it was super easy, Seb Boyer, and Royer, sorry. And this is actually the, the best that I can do. But now, I want to know who won on the women's side. The first female finisher was Luisa Werner. It's German, so I think the W is spelled like, a, said like a V. Um, she was also 22nd overall, which is the highest a woman has placed um, in any of the previous two AMRs. And then second woman, second woman on the road was a woman in a pair called Beth Pascal, but in the women's race, uh, in the solo women's race, the second woman was a woman called Alison Feli Jack, Jacks, Jackamont. Um, she's Canadian, but I assume Quebecois. Mm -hmm. And then Gail Brown, I know how to say that name, 
She was third woman. <laughs> Her favorite. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, we saved us. And uh, that's good. Actually, something that uh, maybe let's pick off quickly and we take it out of the way. Something that was, there was not so much the spotlight on was the pair races. Why did it happen? Last year, so I remember that actually there was a lot of, I don't know, but actually for sure there was some more talks. And usually also during races, there is some talk about the pair competition. This year, I didn't hear talking so much about it. What do you think, people? Why? It was interesting as well because actually, the, like the they they finished pretty high up in the overall, and normally pairs don't tend to finish that high. Um, so that was quite interesting to see. But um, yeah, there just wasn't much talk of it. I'm probably just as guilty for my my coverage. I don't think I mentioned them once. But um, yeah, there was. I guess there was so much action happening in the rest of the race that um, somewhat got overlooked. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and also probably, yeah, as I was saying, I mean, probably also maybe not super huge and big names were there. So this could be also another reason why, uh, yeah, the pair competition was not really there on point. Yeah, but, and it, it, it yeah. tends to be, um, there the generally just tends to be more of a focus on, uh, on solo anyway, I think. Um, I don't know why. Um, I guess there's so many, the, like pairs tend to be a bit of a, a minority uh, in terms of, you know the overall field and quite often um they don't tend to be at the the front end of the race um so maybe that's why the, the like the bulk of the coverage kind of you know focuses on the you know the, the leaders of the women's and the, and the men's yeah no definitely so let's go actually into do we want actually to talk one second about um how was the race and maybe even if everybody knows it maybe we can actually something like put a spotlight one second on how the race was won, as Cosmo Catalano would say. Give us a little, <laughs> little idea of how everything got first. Well, Every it's, it's there, a... is, there is Becky that is trying to kind of distract us with some thoughts of life, <laughs> yeah. but go for it, Josh. <laughs> She's just the problem child today, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Atlas Mountain race, um, but it, it's, it's, it, it seems to be a bit of a race of attrition. Um, and this year was no different. And if anything, the conditions made this year's race even more of an attritional race. So we had quite a lot of um, changes at the front, um, both in the, well, certainly early on in the in the women's, and then quite a bit of drama late on in the in the men's event. Um, so for the for the women, um, it was it was pretty much a kind of a two horse race early on. Um, so Molly Weaver went out fairly fairly quickly. Um, but then she slowed up quite significantly. I think she was got sick on the first day, um, and then ended up with a bit of um, a bad chest. Um, and she just ended up slowing down quite a lot. And then Louisa just did a really strong, consistent ride. Um, and she was way well, not way back, but quite a long way back relatively in the field for the first half of the race, the last men and women. Um, but then, really, you know, when when Molly started um, having to stop to kind of look after her health and stuff she really opened up that gap and then she just basically motored through the field and she was climbing through the, the overall the whole way through um and the men's event uh, was wasn't too dissimilar Eustinus went off hard and early and forgot to turn his tracker on again as as last year um <laughs> but he uh, he held an early lead um i do wonder if he made a few errors. I think he probably would admit to, to making a few errors in the first couple of nights. There wasn't much sleeping, um, but, but, but Robin was there, um, Matea um, and uh, Sebra were, were all kind of floating around that kind of that, that top five. And also um, a guy called, I forgot his name, Ollie, someone. Um, Apologies for that. I'm not very good at names. And they, they all kind of basically <laughs> accelerated away quite early on. But I think it was clear that they were pushing quite hard and there was probably going to be some cracks forming. We, we saw it in last year's race when, you know, people really can drop off. And it kind of happened. Um, Justinus ended up losing the lead on the, the third day, I think. Um, Rumour has it, he, he, uh, one of his tactics was to drink loads of espresso to stay awake. Um, which yes. did work, but only when he went to bed. So he, <laughs> I, I heard he, he got a bottle, an empty bottle of Coke and got four double espressos in it and then was sipping on that through the night, but then got to the point where he needed to rest and then lay down and couldn't, 
can actually sleep. Um, so I think Absolutely. if you asked him that, he'd probably say that was the kind of the crux of of the race for him and where it started to go wrong. And Robin was sleeping more. Um, he had a, a relatively big sleep on, I think it was the second night, um, mm. at two, three hours. And I think that started to kind of pay itself forward later in the race. Um, although Matteo put in a massive charge and ended up overtaking both of them, but then pulled out quite soon after taking the lead with uh, with chest problems, which which was a problem for a lot of riders. Um, so yeah, so the Lustinus was then back in the lead again, but him and Robin were essentially neck and neck. Um, but I think I think basically Robin rode a slightly better paced and executed race than Justinus. And he eventually took mm. took the um the lead and and ended up winning. And Justinus kind of I don't know whether he, he faded or kind of realized that you know he he wouldn't be able to win it. Um so yeah, so Justinus won it. Uh, sorry, um Robin won it, Justinus was second, and then Sebra oh. was kind of just there in the background. Just riding his own race the whole time. I don't think he necessarily had a smooth race, but he was very consistent and just came in for a, a pretty damn solid third. And I think he was only about six hours behind Justinus at the end. Mm. It's been yeah. a, an interesting phenomenon, I think, because you mentioned about Robin's sleep strategy, which was quite um, conservative, relatively speaking. Um, and I think. Sofiane set a tone when he raced in 2020 and it just blew everyone away. I don't think people had seen someone ride on such little sleep. Um, I remember reading a piece Nelson wrote and he it even crossed his mind to kind of mandate that Sofiane had to sleep because from a race organizer's point of view, it was just quite, um, quite worrying. But actually last year, Marin um, or Robin mirrored Marin's tactic of sleeping a little bit more and then just riding faster and I think I mean I'd, I'd like to know what you think about this Josh because we're seeing so many fast riders come into the sport with a background in say gravel road cross-country mountain biking um and it it's akin to the race that you had at further Pyrenees where the the pace of the race is so high when riders are getting that sleep in so we're seeing a a kind of swing away from sleep deprivation to a bit more sleep and then just riding harder. Yeah, definitely. I think as well, when Sofian won the event with essentially no sleep, just a few power naps, that was uh that was twenty February twenty twenty, I believe. Yes. Um, you were both there, weren't you? Um yep. and that was right before the, the pandemic. And this the sport has just changed so much. There's a notable difference between pre pandemic and post pandemic because I think everyone sat at home and you know looked at videos on the internet and you know the atlas got a massive amount of coverage and i think a lot of people reassessed where they were in life and decided they needed a bit of an adventure so there was a lot of new faces coming into the the sport bikepacking and and coming down from different events and probably you know i think the the, the caliber of rider at the front physically are, are stronger you know with this yeah. this kind of professional well maybe not semi-professional but certainly got the engine to be professional background and then they're they're learning now, and everyone thought, oh yeah, you just don't sleep, but it's not very efficient, it really isn't, um, and you just end up trudging and being miserable. And and I think this race proved that sleep is is king. And and even if you go like a week sleeping three hours a night, that's still not very much sleep. Yeah, it's it's, no. it's a relative, isn't it? No. And, and your body just needs to stop i think i think that's yeah. the other thing you can't just keep going and going and going and going you just need to stop even if you don't necessarily go deep deeply asleep you just need to like not be moving for a little bit mm. something that probably we need to highlight there is uh, still on the trend of sleep deprivation and stuff is that first of all i would say that actually we need to put a correlation between uh, the physical problems that people are keep on having if they are not used, of course, to sleep deprivation, and the, far, the fact that they have to scratch. So basically the correlation between sleep deprivation and physical problems. Because now I think that there is not so much really going on in saying that, unfortunately. Because when you see people like Mattia scratching and actually, okay, yes, I mean, uh, scratching maybe the first time was not exactly because of uh, sleep deprivation that he scratched, and he had, he had this accident, but more or less is related. Justinas last year, uh, scratching because of the crash, this probably also because of sleep deprivation. Um, other people, yeah. I don't know, I can imagine, for example, also people like Paul Voss that 
rode completely through the night and then actually ended up scratching also the beginning huge engine anyways because he's a person that was actually riding in the in the proper ton and actually also riding uh, actually driving in that case the competitor of my podcast the bison wagon that's another story no but i mean apart from these jokes uh, we need really to put a bit of light on the fact that as soon as you stop sleeping for i mean because it's not only not sleeping if you don't sleep and you spend your day on the sofa maybe you can actually do something out of it but you're not sleeping you're putting your body into a lot of effort plus we need to consider also that this year the conditions were crazy i mean we went from minus 10 degrees until 20 degrees and the sleeps were even if there was just three hours were pretty cold even if you were beating or uh, camping it was super massive so your body is really under the weather and under a lot of effort so i mean uh, this is something that we need to put as a correlation problem. Yeah, I think also it's not just about being tired and like physically tired and, you know, it's it's the mistakes you make because you're tired. So if you yeah. look at last year's yes. race, look at, look at uh, Marin, he rode a controlled race. He, he, you know, he didn't sleep very much, but he slept at least an hour and a half, two hours a night, which is still nothing. But, the you know, in that last day coming off the old colonial ride, the guy in first, the, the French guy, I can't remember his name, and the, the Belgian guy, they both crashed and cut and like split tires and Eustinus kept crashing. And I just don't believe that it's because they can't ride their bikes. I think it's just because they're so tired and they're pushing it so hard that you then make other mm -hmm. mistakes, which cost you the race, i.e. splitting a tire or crashing because you didn't react quick enough. So I think it's, it's about more than just being tired. Yeah, absolutely. And this uh, is true. I mean, it's not only being tired, but actually not, not being on focus. And maybe that's another thing that we need to um, it's here in our topics. It's something like we saw a lot of uh, breathing problems. Uh, and this was actually the cause of a lot of, uh, of scratching, of course. I don't know, because I'm not a doctor, just first saying that. I don't know if these one things are really related, but also, I don't know, putting your body into pressure can be a problem. Also, in uh, uh, coping with stressful weather situation and plus also breathing situation. I mean, there, correct me if I'm wrong anyways, Josh, it was super dry. It's usually super dry. There is the dust. There was the snow. It was super cold. These are things that are really beating up your body. Yeah, I mean, from, from my kind of... Um... My experience there, my, my trip there in January, which the conditions weren't too dissimilar, but um, obviously I was just touring and I was staying inside pretty much every night. And I did notice when I was up in the mountains, you know, I did have a bit of a cough on my chest. And that was riding in like just in daylight, you know, not not doing the, you know, riding in the deep cold overnight. So I can see that the, um, you know, the, the extreme circumstances during a race would really kind of cause you issues. Um, I think it's probably a combination of, well, fatigue, it's just dry, it's a dry air. And also it was very windy. When I was there in January, there was a very cold wind and I, I was talking to Rich Rothwell actually earlier this morning and he was saying it was kind of warm enough to sweat when the sun was on you, but then the wind was still cold. So you're kind of sweating and chilling at the same time. And, you know, it's, it's going to take the moisture out of your breath. You, it's a dusty place and you're riding off road. So that's going to dry you out. And then you're you're not recovering, um, so I'm I'm not surprised that that there was a lot of um, kind of breathing issues. And I think probably if you ask most people who scratched, it probably would be breathing issues. Mm -hmm. And actually about the dry, the dry conditions, something that I noticed. I mean, if you check the photo of Robin at the finish line, and then you see his lips. I mean, how impressive yes. is that? Yeah, I think that's a standard in in, in those. It's, it's, if it's windy, even if it's a gentle breeze, it, it just dries you out. And, I mean, windy in a desert, you're not going to win, are you? You just have to like no. continually put like lip stuff on, and it's, it's almost the number one thing. You know, you think about putting sunscreen on, but you don't think about putting UV protection on your lips because it just you just get dried out. Um, and if you think that's doing that's what's going on to your lips. Imagine what's happening to your lungs, which kind of need to be kept kind of relatively moist. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. In the meantime, people that are listening, uh, nothing is happening here. There's probably some noise coming out of the, coming in from a window, but there are no fights between kids. <laughs> At least in my place. Becky, is everything all right here? <laughs> um, I think it's me. They're not my children, uh, I should say, but I can hear some kids near here. Are there dogs as well? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dogs and the roster, roosters. Sorry, it's a little bit of a something. But it's nice and it keeps the spirit high. But I just want to say that no kid has been hurting while we are recording, isn't it? Or they are fighting so hard. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you actually doing, uh, Becky? Where, where are you? Just to put it in context. Exactly. Give a bit of context, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm in a place called Puerto Barras uh, in, in Chile. Um, I'm doing a, it's like a working holiday. And I'm staying with uh, some hosts. And it's fairly rural and the internet isn't great. So that's why I'm the cause of many uh, many of our recording woes. Um but uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Although I didn't, I had no idea about where I should go in Chile. So I kind of just threw a dart at a map and I've ended up in a place that has the same climate as Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> it's the middle of their summer and I'm in a merino base layer, a down gilet and it's like 15 degrees and cloudy. And I was expecting a proper summer holiday. I've got loads of SPF, loads for my lips as well. <laughs> And I'm not going to use it for a while. So you know all about the conditions in the Atlas, then, don't you? <laughs> yeah. I think that's. I think that's. Uh, it's a serious point in some respects because I think a lot of people. I mean, on a number of levels with the Atlas Mountain Race, it's got so much publicity since the first edition, and obviously that was perfect timing because it was literally the last thing that happened before lockdown. Um, and then obviously no one had anything to talk about, so Atlas Mountain Race got loads of loads of coverage in all the magazines in all languages and everyone looks at you and goes oh look, that looks nice look at those mountains what a lovely way to spend February riding around in the sunshine and then yes. obviously it's the mountains they can always be cold and this year um, the, the locals were telling me in January it's been particularly cold this year um, you know mm -hmm. un unseasonally unseasonally cold so that's going to catch a lot of people out and I think a lot of people get drawn into these events by the by the amazing imagery which is great but it's hard work and it's a lot harder than it's not just a gravel ride. It's 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 like brutal. Um, and I think yeah. that kind of that shows when you look at the re results and, and, and the races and, you know, how suddenly the scratch list goes from very few to a lot of people all at once. Mm. Yeah. It's um, you mentioned about the cold and the dry and the, the wind and the snow, but. I just saw on the Atlas Mountains Instagram page that some of the mid to backpack riders faced a sandstorm as they headed back west towards the coast. And I just thought this race has it all because you could so easily be forgiven for assuming it's going to be a nice summer holiday. Uh, and then you end up in the, in the mountains that are throwing every challenge possible at you. And it's, it's three races and three different sets of conditions. The first one was quite nice by all accounts. Mm. Yeah, probably was well, the you, best you weather-wise. Yeah, probably yeah. the best weather-wise, definitely. There was just some snow and some cold at the first night, but actually everybody rode up to the first pass with a lot of sunshine, but the weather there, 2020, was really good. Yeah, and, you know, mm. 2,000 metres, you're always going to have some weather. Um, last year, in October, it rained, and and again, there was a big sandstorm. Um, so if you look at a lot of the photos from, from the last edition, it's just gloomy. And there was a lot of sand and dust in the air. Um, and then this year, mm. it's, it's nice and clear, but just brutally cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that I thought was really interesting, if anyone is listening from home and looking at uh, map progress, if you change the base map uh, on the top right, you can shoot, I think it's set as streets automatically. But if you change it to satellite on map progress and zoom out, you can see just how brown it is. Yeah, it's um, there's not much there. I think any any kind of any greenery is agriculture, really. Mm. I think there's, there's yes, a lot of a, a few oases, but you know, they are what they are. There are there are oases oases at the very sort of limited places where there is kind of natural water. Um, but yeah, aside from agriculture, they're just certainly in in that area of Morocco, there just isn't much greenery. And I mean, well. To race around a desert so i guess <laughs> i guess you should expect that somewhat <clears throat> a desert with snow so. well yeah and rain last time <laughs> yeah. anyways thanks a lot for showing me how to do this like if, because i didn't know actually that i could change the view of uh, the map progress but it's so very interesting it's 
it's crazy. I mean, yes. It's really cool, isn't it? Especially if you mm-hmm. zoom out even more and you can see Rwanda, which is where the other race we'll talk about is. Yeah. Um, even though it doesn't have the countries on the satellite map, you kind of just have to know where Rwanda is. Um, and you can see the the challenges the riders will face there are the exact opposite. Polar opposite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so green and luscious. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Cool. Another topic that actually could be interesting. I don't know. I didn't make my. I mean, I have to be completely sincere. I didn't do my. Or, uh, I didn't uh, put on my homework in place there. Uh, but what about the pace? How was actually the pace compared to the two years before? For sure, I think that still the record is on uh, Sofiane, isn't it? No, um, Marin. Marin. It's, Marin. But, but okay. it's the, the the problem is it's not a direct comparison because it's different it's been... route. Three three different routes. Um, yeah. Although Robin's finish time was was it just over four days, um, and uh, Marin was a, uh, he's just under. He's three twenty. Just under. Well, that's rapid then. That's definitely a faster pace mm. than last year. I would have thought. Um, I think Marin was about three. He was about twelve hours ahead of me. I think, and I was four days, six hours, or something. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I would have thought that's um, probably slightly faster, um, yes. but obviously you, you don't quite know how that that is. About 150, is it 150k more, something like that. I'm just having a quick look. Um, so yeah. last year was one 1,170, and this year was 1,330. So yeah, 150k. Yeah. So that's going to make a difference. Um, um, I don't, and I, I don't think that was a, an easy finish either, from what I've heard. There was a lot of climbing. There was a big stretch, hiker biking through the desert, just literally in, I think it was 12K of, of sand. Yeah. A lot of people were that. cursing Nelson. He, I think he likes yes. to chuck those in just to, uh, <laughs> just to fish people off. <laughs> yeah. Just when you think you're on the final home run in, bam, you're walking yeah. again. Yeah. Standard really, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, another cool <laughs> thing talking about the end of the race also Robin got I think a flat, I don't know. I mean he was probably running two blasts, so it was not a pinch flat, but you know what I mean? In uh, last thirty yeah. kilometers, forty kilometers really on the way back home. And, yeah, uh, there, there's some images. He managed to punch it just in front of the photographer, so it's, um <laughs> they, they caught him. I I think photographers carry a set of tacks with them. Because you've had it, haven't you, Josh? Oh, where yeah. James Robertson's caught you fixing a flat. Well, no, the reason I flatted is because I looked up because I saw him and then hit a rock. So he is, <laughs> he is wholly responsible for my flat tyre in the Highland Trail. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then he took loads of photos, so I'm getting covered in bloody sealant. And you know what James is like, he wasn't <laughs> subtle about it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Anyway, something that I just want to, let's mention it quite quickly. I mean, the coverage of the race was super nice. I mean, as usual in this kind of races, but I mean, you can really see a lot of uh, super talented photographers being there and the images are just, I mean, of course, also uh, the, the landscape there helps a lot as well, but I think that actually they found super good spots and super good photos. And also this year, the coverage was really, really, really interesting. I mean, talking about the, yeah. the organization as well. Yeah, I think, um, well, Mm. I've said it before, Nelson just does such an excellent job with these events. I mean, the courses are brilliant. The kind of general infrastructure for riders in terms of the sign-on and, you know, getting everything together. Like, it gives you just enough for it to not to be, like, a massive chore, but not too much. Um, Again, with the the checkpoints are decent. Um, Because, I mean, I guess you have to because... It is quite an inhospitable inhospit- place. It's not like it's a like a short road race around Europe or any race around Europe where you can just, you know, fall into a town at any given moment. It is properly remote. And I think a lot of people underestimate that about the, the Atlas. Um, so I think uh, I think Nelson does a very good job of um, of keeping it kind of remote and hard. But there's just enough of a kind of a a security blanket for people who might just get themselves in a bit in, in a bit deep a bit deeper than they expect yeah. yeah my my only uh i guess criticism is i'm just not a fan of this style of instagram photos where you kind of overlay photos and you have multiple 
uh, I see it's a recent trend now. I don't really speak photography, so I don't know how to say this, but you kind of, when you swipe photos, you've got a bit of the next one on the right hand side. Yeah. It's like a collage. I f yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you, Josh. Like a collage. And I just feel like the Atlas is so stunning that so many of these photos just get lost. Um, and it's, it's yeah. just too much going on. I think it's, um, it, it's just a personal, um, yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can find some but... on the, uh, I think I'm sharing my screen now. Um, uh, okay, we're going yes. to play that. <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of uh, maybe something like um, nerd kind of explanation, social media nerding at the end of the day is part of my job as well. The only point is yeah. that I don't know how much it's really affecting something like an account, like the Atlas Monterey's account, where people are going to land there anyways because of the event, not because of the algorithm. But that's a good way to place the algorithm, to please the algorithm, sorry. Because if you're putting something like into the scrolling of the carousel, more photos, people are a bit more willing to something like swipe. Engage, and then I guess. As the more actually oh. people are spending on that, the more people, the more people are spending time on swapping and uh, swiping. Sorry, the more the algorithm actually gives you some prices because it means that people are spending more time on your photos and all this bullshit. Sorry, uh, that's so swear, interesting. But that's the thing, and I, I, I'm completely, I completely agree with you because it's so disturbing to have photos like this. I mean, I'm on my phone. I want to actually to live my experience by checking all the photos. And if I can give actually a little tip to uh, the social media way of doing these things, especially for a endurance event, we don't need that. Because people that are checking those uh, photos are going to be there anyways. And you don't need to please the algorithm because me personally and everybody who is really following these events is going to anyway swipe. So um, yeah, that's the thing that I would say. Yes. But then completely with you, I completely feel your pain, Becky, because I also don't like it at all. Because you're really missing a lot of the good photos that can be there. I do 100%. see why the photographers. Sorry, I was saying I do, I do see why the photographers like to do it though, because you get a lot of, like, if you put all that effort in to get the images, you do get a lot in a very small space. Um, but maybe it kind of waters yeah. down the quality, not the quality, but the kind of impact of each photo. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few examples here on the screen. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a way to get, say, 20 photos into eight photos, but I think I think you'd just be better off with eight really good photos. Yeah. Probably. But what do I know? Yeah. <laughs> My Instagram page is private. <laughs> no, but, may, but you know what, people, what I say most of the time that they see these things, and I like anyways to follow these kind of races on social media, I can tell you that personally I can't wait then at a certain point to see this event back on the good old paper in some magazines and stuff and then really you take the most out of it I remember um when was it I wrote an article for the Italian magazine it's called Avento not to make advertising but actually I wrote an article there uh, I've been not writing for them quite for quite a while now um but actually there you know it was this last article that I wrote it was exactly about the Silk Road Monte race and the one before was about the migration gravel race these photos on paper they are completely a different playground. And I'm pretty sure that about the Atlas Monterey's this magazine in Italian, but they're gonna write something as well for sure. And some of these huge and amazing photos are gonna be there. And uh, this is gonna actually make me peace again with the photography on paper. That is the thing that I like yes. the most, more than just social media, swiping around in small screens. And actually I've been missing a bit also some cool coverage also on some website and stuff about these kind of races because now you can only see the classic photos from uh, the pro tour and everything stunning of course amazing photographers there but also this kind of adventure should be a bit more um, on top of the game i think because we cannot leave all these uh, reports only to social media that's what i believe personally i yeah. agree i can't wait to get some of those photos in my hand in print yeah Cool. Um, to move forward, I don't know. Do you want to kick off any other topic, Becky? I can see you scrolling through the document that you wrote because it was for me. <laughs> you can forget about that. <laughs> ah, too much responsibility. I did. I did have a look at the scratch rates of the previous years, and now all the riders are in. We know the scratch rate is forty percent for this year. Um, and in the first year, it was only 35%. And then last year was 29%. And 
I'd I guess I assume that the inaugural event will always have a higher scratch rate because it catches people out um, but actually I think I guess this year the weather and the conditions caught people out more than the inaugural event did um, I think so, um, which I think so I'd say I think Decathlon in Marrakesh did some good business for winter gloves and extra tights before the start because Love it. I think you're 100 right. I think people got there and were like, bloody hell, it's, it's colder here than it is in the UK or wherever they've come from, and, and quickly panicked and and just went to buy everything they could. And thankfully, Marrakesh um, is probably one of the few places in that region that does have uh, things like a Decathlon where you where you can get kind of mm. more specific cycling gear or general outdoor warm stuff yeah no, that's true that's true and that's something probably that also is gonna affect a bit more i mean this kind of race i mean usually a 1000 kilometer event is considered a small race a fast race so people are really under gearing and i think that probably the people mm. should start thinking to this race in a different way they already started thinking this race in another way by bringing their mountain bikes and not more gravel bikes now they're going to start thinking as well about maybe I should bring a tent instead of a BV and everything related to that. Well, I think it's, it's um, I mean, in some respects, it's a bit of a worrying trend because you see people turn up. Like Justinus, to sleep in, he had an inflatable pillow and a foil blanket. And it's just totally inadequate. It's just it's mm. dangerous, like downright dangerous, to be frank. And people see, like, for example, people like Sofia not taking anything. And I use Sofian as an example because he's, he's, you know, probably one of the most well-known, um, certainly male bike packers, um, and obviously won the race. And people see bike checks and things, think, oh, all you need is is a down jacket and a full blanket. And yeah, Sofian can get away with it. And he's probably used to taking those kind of risks and com comfortable with it. But then you get someone who's going half the speed is going to take twice the amount of time. And they think, oh, well, the top guys, they just take full blankets. So that's what I need. And that's when you have like issues. And I, I actually, actually think, um, I think for the Silk Road this year, there's been such a trend like that that Nelson has made a like a mandatory um, hit list. And I think he, he said said to Justinus, like you literally you, you not you will not be able to start if you line up with just a full blanket. I will not let you start yeah. because someone's. I mean, those conditions. Someone someone could have got in real trouble. Mm. And ultimately, if something goes wrong, um, it can come back on the organiser and jeopardise every future edition of the race. Um, so it's it's in everyone's interest to not cock up. Definitely. And I think when you're, I mean, you are taking quite a big risk. Like, like if you're someone like Nelson, um, you're putting a lot of riders and advertising to a lot of people. And it's in your interest as an organiser to get the numbers there to make the event more viable financially, if that's all you're doing, which, which. Nelson is there's a lot of responsibility because if something happens and I've had this chat with with people like well Nelson last year at the Atlas when when the rivers are up he's like well I'm just I can't let you go through because it's on my shoulders and if someone gets washed away that I'm it's my responsibility absolutely um so I think mm. and I think some sometimes riders don't necessarily appreciate that they just think it's all a great big holiday and a jolly which it is but you can't go in the mountains and you know, and things go wrong, you know, like quite regularly. Um, you, you just can't control everything, even if we're the best will in the world. And, you know, the, the Atlas Mountain Race does have, well, I'd say all of Nelson's races do actually have more assistance available for when, you know, when slash if shit does hit the fan. Um, because they are more remote and they, you know, in, in Europe, if you if you have to press that big red button on your spot tracker, you'll probably get helicopters to pick you up. If you do that in somewhere like Morocco or Kyrgyzstan, there's not nothing's going to come. So, so as part of the race, Nelson actually has to put on like two. I think there's Medi medevac vehicles, which which are kind of yeah. there in the background. Um, and if you do get in trouble, they you know that that is what will, <laughs> well, that that's what will be picking you up. But if you're up a mountain and you know a four wheel drive is going to take a long time to get to you, so. Um, I think uh, I, 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 it's important to kind of point these things out because I think sometimes people get who are maybe aren't so experienced in the in the outdoors. Maybe they're cyclists and, and they're they're new to bikepacking. And they, you, you see the, the the print magazines, you see the the Instagrams and the videos, 
and it looks incredible and it is incredible but there is a big danger and if you're not experienced and you get yourself in trouble you know it's it's easy to get caught out even if you are experienced in, in like the mountains and extreme conditions so it's um yeah you just, you just got to be careful and aware i think um so yes yeah, so sometimes i think there is a bit of responsibility for the people at the front to maybe not tell everyone just to take a silk a, a foil blanket because yeah. it's dumb <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have actually a little anecdote about that, and then I want to tell you also another thing. But the anecdote is, I remember clearly in uh, the first and the second, probably the second. I mean, for sure, it's no, it was the first. I was interviewing Nelson for the the podcast, not the official podcast for my podcast, and I remember that was written clearly in the book, uh, something like. There was used to be in Kyrgyzstan. There was used to be um, an helicopter for saving people. Uh, actually, it broke last year. So if you're out there, if you are into any travel, be sure to be to be safe, or to have the space or the mind space and also the physical space to cover yourself and to get to get shelter somewhere because it can take quite quite a while for you to take it over. So also Nelson makes it pretty pretty clear that don't put really the boundaries really too forward because it can be. Uh, can be really risky, but that's something that we need also to consider. It's not only a characteristics that happens only characteristics that happen only in uh, in Kyrgyzstan or in Morocco. Maybe Morocco doesn't look sound super remote because it's close to Europe, anyways. But actually, also if you are going to the island trail to I fifty, right? Also there is risky, and it's in Scotland. I mean, it's it's super remote, but it's actually probably a few miles away from where you need people. So. I mean, you need to be careful. You're outside. You're into the elements. So well, believe me, where you are, um, Stefano. In you know, you're not far from the mountains. You could go out, ride from your house, and get yourself in trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, even even me here. I mean, you've ridden further east, or you've been around further east. You could like fall off your bike and you know have an accident, and people aren't going to find you that easily. And if you're on, you know, in some of those kind of the fen areas. And it's windy and cold. You can get cold and in trouble pretty quickly. Um, Absolutely. Mm. So yeah, just it's. Uh, I guess it's part of it, though, isn't it? That that's kind of what makes it exciting. And some people like that danger element, but some people are just totally, um, I guess, naive and inexperienced about it. And you know that that can cause issues. Um, yeah. But but yeah. But I, I think Nelson as a whole, you know, he promotes the event and promotes people to go and do it. But there is a fairly good kind of safety net there. Just yeah. in case. Um, yeah. Just maybe not the same for all organizers. <laughs> yeah. Maybe something that I want to underline. We were exactly doing that. There are, I remember the time that I was in Kyrgyzstan, and there probably what is the most remote place we've ever been. But there were two, I think, two or three uh, doctors' car that, as you were saying, they are not into the tracking, but actually they are mm. usually following the people that they think, and there is, anyways, a huge kind of uh, checking at things around, but where they think that people can be a bit more in trouble and who usually can be more in trouble. Uh, so people that they say that they're struggling for a few days or whatever, there is these two cars that usually are taking are taking care about of this situation because I mean, it's remote. And that's something that is really together with the thing that you were also mentioning before people, the um, finding the right place to do the checkpoints. I mean, this is really part of it's not that easy to make one of those mountain races, and I think that actually is taking care quite a bit more than decent. I would say quite good. Uh, yeah. From I, I mean, you have to ride it. You, you, like as, a, as an organizer, you can't just draw a line on a map. Absolutely, um, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And and you know, Nelson is a rider, and he's he's ridden like TCR and Highland Trail and things like that. And you can really tell when you ride that route because yeah, it's tough. There's sections, and you think, oh god, I just this is too much. But then you kind of you get to a checkpoint and you realize actually it was quite quite well kind of calculated so um you know it's uh it's it's the night that's the nice thing about atlas because it it is really tough and it is really hard and it is really remote but just when you're at that point mentally when you just can't quite hack it anymore like there's a nice town with some kind of civilization or a checkpoint which is pretty good or a nice road section so it's uh it's a very well balanced course i would say yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And he's still, and he's definitely going to, Nelson will definitely stitch you up at the end. There'll definitely be some unannounced hike bank. Absolutely. <laughs> but, and that's something uh, that I want actually then to, uh, to kick off also another conversation, but you will be sure that there's going to be somebody at the end, if you arrive at the end, but even if you scratch and then you arrive in ways at the end, somebody holding you a beer 
for the time that you are passing this finish line. I actually was checking the um, Luisa's uh, rap video on the Instagram, and it's a real or whatever you want to call it. Don't go deep too deep into that. And it's clearly there. There is Florence, that is Nelson's mom, that actually was waiting for her there at the finish line with a beer, something like passing this beer to celebrate. That's another super good thing. I mean, you can still feel this kind of family feeling. There is really some family feeling there, and also the community spirit is 100% there. It's tough, it's a pain in the butt. You would really, I mean, I think you can swear and insult Nelson during the race for most of the time, but the cool thing is that everybody's going to be waiting for you there, if you're the first or if you're the last one, and that's really nice. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'd like to say, you know, it's his, his, his parents are both involved. Yeah. Um, and you know his, his mum and dad. It's a family affair. Yeah, it's great. And um, I mean, uh, we, we were we we're going to talk about the uh, the golden tagines, which is uh, the prizes. And um, so so when the, the top three and um, first pairs and the top three women and various other prizes, the the, the, the reward is. I mean, bike packing. It's not it's not like a much of a prize giving sport. Um, but you do get a nice golden tagine with your name and everything written on it. And uh, the, I, I like the fact that it's it's Flo Nelson's mum who uh, who puts those and does them by hand before the race. <laughs> Although so I don't think Eustinus's paint was quite dry when he kicked his up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love we it. should probably <laughs> clarify when we say tagine, we're not talking about the meal. It is oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the ceramic in which tagine. you cook. Yeah. <laughs> Just put That's your hands out. Pot, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Tagine pot, yeah. Uh, but do we want actually to talk quickly about the... Um, quickly let's talk about actually uh, the women's race because that's something that actually you have highlighted really good uh, Becky and uh, it's actually about the um, how high Luisa arrived in the full field so she arrived in 22nd position and I think that at a certain point she was really putting in danger also the top 20 while Jenny Tuff the first year she was 61st and mm -hmm. the hash was 50 uh, sorry 40 Sorry, I was actually reading numbers in the German way, not that I speak German. <laughs> um, uh, how do you think actually this, I mean, it was super interesting anyways, following the race there, um, because so many cool characters and also with different characteristics to look like kind of a superhero kind of race that we were following. But what happened there? I think the women's race was really exciting. And this is often the case with many, uh, many races. The kind of male favorites you can pick out four or five of them quite easily and we did and they were the top three in this occasion plus a few scratches whereas the women's races are often a lot more open uh, and this one definitely was I know we picked out Molly's name because she's a well-known British racer um, we've come across her before uh, we picked out Gail but there are other names that we hadn't heard of or didn't know enough about to, to pull them out and Louisa was one of those and I think Josh, uh, Josh picked up that she's not a uh, she's not a novice athlete, is she? No, she she was um, she was a rower, I believe. Um, someone someone sort of sent me a message when I was doing my coverage saying, well, she's actually she was an under twenty three world champion rower. Um, you know, and if you're if, if you're a rower, then you're just strong, and you've obviously got a massive engine, and it's kind of what you need. And then if you can apply the kind of the skills of looking after yourself and you know fueling yourself and keeping going then you're going to do well at this kind of thing and I guess that mindset um, and I think she'd also she's not necessarily come out of nowhere maybe you know to mm. our awareness but she's also won uh, the race across or been the first woman at the race across France and Italy divide and there was another event as well so she's actually um, pretty damn experienced so when you put all those things together mm. it's, it's no real surprise um, so yeah, it's interesting to see, and uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about the the pro men, you know, the Lachlan Mortons of the world, and people like that going mm -hmm. in. But then we had a similar thing here with with the women, with with Molly, and maybe Molly wasn't on top form, but she's still got that World Tour engine. So it's nice to see the kind of that it's not all about just being super strong. You've got to look mm -hmm. after yourself, and you know, ride conservatively in a lot of respects. Um, but I also think it's probably a, a good sign for the general sport that that there are more women coming out of the woodwork and just doing really well, because that means there's probably more women taking part or feeling like they can take part. And I guess it's a bit of a snowball and it takes a while to get going. 
Um, Definitely. Um, and Jenny Tuff is a great example of this, of how visibility is one of the, um, uh, how do I say, like one of the most effective ways to encourage more women in. And I quote her when I say, you have to see it in order to be it. Um, so the more women yeah. we see racing, the more women would attract into racing. Um, but to see to see Louisa come twenty second overall was brilliant. I was I was really hoping we'd see a woman crack the top twenty, and at times Louisa was sitting in the top twenty, and I I was hoping as the race progressed, she would move up the rankings. I think she she did get in the top twenty right near the end, but I believe she had a bit yeah. of a, a crash in in that final running, and um, she like she only had five gears or something and um, lost one of her kind of clip on bars and things. So obviously it wasn't like totally smooth sailing, but you know she still you know, have the, you know, the wherewithal to, to sort her bike out and get to the finish and still do a really top result. And I think a lot of people in that field, I mean, she, she was actually on that far behind people like Rich Rothwell, who we all, we all know, and is a very experienced yeah. person. And, you know, to be honest, she probably would have got him if she not had a bit of a crash. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's good to see. And she you know, that there's no reason why, um, you know, why women can't, do well at these events and certainly it's been proven before you know with people like Lael and Sarah Hammond on the long mm. races I think the longer the race the 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 the, the more um more chance there is for women to like really you know not just challenge for the you know the first woman in the race but but the overall because if you look at that race there was a lot of men who just went out stupidly hard and just cracked yeah. and it's a four-day race for the, the fast games four or five four or five days the tour divide you know looking at 14 days you know the uh, the quickest time pretty much mm. you know imagine when who's i was gonna crack and, and how fast you know if louisa was really like we you know, we probably suspect looking after herself if the race was double the length i'm pretty sure she would be right in the edge of the top 10 100 percent, absolutely absolutely yeah. and you mentioned about a couple of riders going out quite hard um in my dark days of road racing we used to call them the the mum and dad rides because that would be the time where you'd say hey mom hey dad look at me I'm off the front and um, I think that um that tendency is a little bit more male women often race more conservatively and then move up the rankings throughout the race I would agree can we that. talk about <laughs> can we talk a little bit about that actually there was in one of your live shot uh, Josh that you actually really talked about that quite precisely I would say and you were saying that basically men are usually trying to, uh, how would you say that, discourage each other by going as fast as possible, trying to put the ego in front and a bit less the care of ourselves or themselves a bit on the back. Kind of a testosterone thing, we can say. But anyway, this looks like a bit, I beat you, I will beat you physically. Well, it's not always like this. And that's why what actually these races are showing us most of the time. Yeah, I don't, I don't think these races reward that kind of attitude. I mean, may, maybe this maybe this race just about does. Well, maybe, maybe, well, I don't know. This is a really tough race. It's a four-day race on paper or just under, which looks short, but it's a very hard one. Mm. Maybe if it was a, a smoother race and a faster race, you could muscle your way through. If you look at things like Badlands, they are more mm. kind of, I think they're, they, they reward that kind of, that attitude to just go out hard and hang on. Well, the winners so do it without sleep don't they really exactly well like essentially it's, it's almost like a long gravel race rather than an ultra nowadays for, for yeah. the front for the top yeah. 10 15 anyway and i think that's probably where the the male kind of physical makeup of of more kind of i guess raw strength just through like you mm. know sheer muscle size and um like body composition probably pays off whereas it just shows that it's not all about that and um you know it's it's kind of you got to be smart and I think women generally are a little bit more, maybe, maybe a bit more conservative naturally, which, which mm -hmm. maybe helps in the long term. Certainly, I mean, just well, look at Louisa as a perfect example. She she moved up the field the whole time until right at the end when she was probably um, suffering a few kind of issues with, with her bike and things after the crash. Um, and again, you know, even look at Lael and Divide and stuff. Her, her her time is one of the top times in the you know ever. So. Yeah. It's, um, so it's definitely want, doable. Yeah, something that I want just to, uh, something like, sh I would say, highlight a tiny bit. We were talking, you were talking about um, Becky, 
while Josh is going to take some a glass of water. I think he needs. Uh, talking about dust, that's what happened. But you were talking before about Jenny Tuff, and actually something that I like all the time to highlight is that we have also to remember that Jenny finished the first Silk Road Mountain Race. We're talking about one 2018 in sixth position overall. And uh, that's another thing that actually you would not imagine. Also, the first time that uh, this kind of races, the Silk Road Monte race showed up, it was a completely incognito thing because everybody was expecting yeah. to have wolves. And uh, I heard somebody that should they should bring something like a weapon. I would not go deep into that uh, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable, it's whatever. And then I think that we saw something like 45, if not 48 percent of scratches in that race. And still, mm. Jenny showed up there. She didn't have any trouble. Also, she's an experienced mountaineer, then mountaineer, mountaineer. And uh, she actually she arrived there, and uh, she ended up in top ten position in probably for sure something like that showed uh, showed being a super tough race. This is the kind mm. of uh, you will you can make it if you see this, uh, and that's a super great example. And having this. Uh, women being there on top of the field and showing how they are racing in their own way and not just making the same mistakes or the same strategies as other people. This is really something that is going to make this kind of sport that we all love progress a tiny bit. Yeah, absolutely. And Jenny was also the only female finisher in the first edition. Absolutely. Um, and Road is some... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Silk Road's something of uh, an anomaly because I think it is, it's as much a mountain race as it is a bike race. Mm. Um, and I think that that favours Jenny and it does also favour the perhaps slightly the more risk averse, the more well prepared. Um, and some people would argue women um, are kind of stronger in those attributes and some of the off the bike attributes and perhaps the pre-race preparation. Um, but I, yeah, I think Josh is right about the length of the race. Um, and we are seeing, it's something we noticed last year in races, because we are so used to seeing Lale and Sarah Hammond and Fiona Kolbinger. And they are, I think they might be anomalies um, because they came into their first races and just just cleaned up. And that that is great, but I also think we need to see women working, kind of working their way up. Um, up the positions each year. Jana Kessenheim is a great example. She's gone back to the Three Peaks Challenge. She's moved up into the top 10. Um, and then a lot of the shorter European races, we saw women sitting around sixth to eighth, which is, is something of a new trend. And they are just moving up the rankings through coming back, getting better. Um, and I think those stories are... Uh, are better to highlight um, because sometimes you see people like Jenny Tuff and Leah Wilcox and they are the finished product. They're great female role models, but we don't know Leah when she first started racing. We don't know Jenny when she got into this. So sometimes it can be hard to look at them and see yourself getting into the sport because they are years away. I think it's also reflective of the state of the sport um, because it is it, there's more opportunities now and there's more people coming into it and the level's just going up. It's just not as easy to, to get a top result, men, male or female. Um, mm. it, it's just more competitive. So you, you just can't necessarily think, oh, well, um, so-and-so has done this, so I can do that as well. It just doesn't work. And even, even myself, you know, I, I, I've been doing it quite a while and it's really hard for me to almost get in the top five and sometimes you think top 10 is a good result nowadays and like not that long ago I'd be a bit disappointed if I wasn't right at the front but it's, it's just it's, it's been noticeable since the pandemic and I think we'll put it this way if, if I think um if, if Sofian lined up this year I don't think he would have won I think it's a whole different interesting level. That's an interesting, interesting thing. That's super interesting. But yeah, because I mean, something that actually I would just highlight, and then we're going to talk how much I miss so dumb this time, uh, but for other reasons. Uh, but actually, uh, it depends also on the attitude. That's what I believe. I mean, if you go, I, not blaming anybody or maybe blaming somebody, but if you go into a race like this with a field like it is, we, from a pro career, but or with a strong engine or whatever, you go there and you said, I'm going to go there, I'm going to show up on the start line and I'm going to beat everybody because I'm the fastest. I would say 98% you're not winning. But if you go there with 
uh, time after the other with um, the goal of learning something. I mean, that's something that, for example, I see completely um, with Marin, uh, that won actually the last edition, is not showing up at races, just pushing his and uh, strengthening his muscles and that's it, but actually is showing up to any race with the goal of learning. Uh, you can see him doing, I don't know, TCR all the time, jumping a bit more uh, up into the finish into the finish list and then he was actually for example at Silk Road Monterey's and you could see there really with a lot of uh, uh, need and will of uh, improving and learning he actually took part to the Hop 1000 here in Switzerland he won it but actually also there with a, a different attitude of learning something so if you actually take part to races with the goal of learning and make every time an improvement, then maybe this is the winning attitude that you're gonna have. There, there, there's no easy wins nowadays in this this sport. It's um, there's too many good people, and also we're what are we now? Like ten years into kind of commercial bikepacking, I'd say the first TCR was mm -hmm. 2013, and for me, obviously, I mean this could be controversial, but obviously like Tour Divide and stuff was there before. But for me, the TCR was the first kind of organized and promoted by a promoter kind of bikepacking event, certainly in Europe. Mm -hmm. And now we're 10 years down the line from that. So you can see what that kind of legacy is. And there's more people, there's more events. There's almost events every single weekend, isn't there? And, you yeah. know, in the summer months. And that just means there's more people learning and more opportunities to learn and more awareness. So more people coming into it from different areas, you know, rather than that kind of hardcore of slightly kind of weird people who started doing it early on. Um, Probably include myself in that. With their beards and shaggy hair. Yeah, well, I didn't wear my check shirt today. <laughs> but, but I mean, my point is that there's so many more people like coming into the the kind of the top of the funnel, and you know, and and therefore that, that there's more people who can do well and and push at these events, and we're seeing it, you know, at all the events now. And and I think the the COVID sort of lockdown was was probably a a big turning point for whatever reason. Um, a lot more people became aware and decided maybe that's something they might want to try. And as a result, the, the, the standard of races has gone through the roof. I mean, even look at TCR. I mean, early days, you know, I think I won by like 36 hours. Christoph won most of his by 24, 30 hours. James won <laughs> by a massive margin on both of his, I think. And now we're talking like top five within like less than a day almost, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. let's go. That's absolutely true. But something that I want to highlight as well, and then probably we can move to the next topic, is for sure you have a lot of things that you can learn around, and actually there are, you have a lot of material that you can check. And also, I think that coach and coaching and everything became also a bit more oriented on that. While before it was just a tried and error. But the cool thing is also that we are also inside of uh, a community that is really cool and really welcoming. I don't, I mean, I actually uh, repeat this a lot, but actually that's what I found as well. It's super easy if you want to start a race and you're a newbie to send out a message via Instagram or whatever, and people there just answer to your uh, message or arrange a call where they can give you tips, maybe not in order for you to win, but in order for you to complete and uh, take a lot of experience. And that's the cool part also of the sports that we are into. For sure it's commercial, for sure there are way more sponsors inside, you can see also the developing or a different way, um, a different categories of athletes. Basically, they're only doing bikepacking events now. But also, on the other side, it's still super cool the community spirit. I was actually stopping in the meantime on the bit of the sentence because I was saying something that I'm gonna tell you privately. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> Ooh, I guess I'm on excited. that point, the, um, <laughs> it is still kind of a participation sport. We're not talking like it's an elite peloton, is it? There's maybe 10, 15 people who want to race really hard at the front. Most people are just trying to get around. And I'd argue actually the front guys are just trying to get around, but they're getting around a lot faster. Mm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. Moving on with the topics. Uh, do you want to say something? Sorry, Becky. Did I interrupt you, Becky? No, uh, I was just going to say how many of the, uh, the mid pack and even some of the front runners have full time jobs as well. Um, mm. This still is a hobby for most people. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's cool actually having kind of a group of people that are in the other side battling in the top position and if they have time they're going to take with their phone and send you a message by giving you some tips and stuff and I saw it happening that's why I'm saying it and that's cool maybe we want to move uh, on the highlights that we saw on social or is it too early for that no let's let's do it bring up that photo Josh I'm trying uh, just just talk yes. amongst yourselves for a few seconds <laughs> there's a there's a photo that 
who we've mentioned Rich Rothwell. Um, there we go. Can you see that? It's come up a few times. Can I see it? Yes, I can. <laughs> can you unsee that? It's crazy. My God, shall I report it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so just, just for context, uh, this is Rich Rothwell, who I believe finished 18th in the end. Um, and well, let, let's uh, let's go and look what he looked like before the race. This <laughs> sense. In the meantime, while you're looking for that, let me do something like the little uh, kind of uh, adverts that I'm doing. People, if you're just listening to this podcast, the link is down in the description below because you need to check. Maybe I'm going to make a photo or a JPEG with a comparison, but go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so, um, well, if, if you're uh, in front of your, your computer, follow uh, Stefano on YouTube. Um, if you're listening, then this makes no sense, but there's a photo of Rich looking very fresh before the start. <laughs> he looks awesome. Shame, I mean. almost. And then, yeah, and then, then we get to Rich's finished photo, and he looks <laughs> like he's getting on for 80. He's, um, I think <laughs> yeah. it just shows you how incredibly difficult this race was. I mean, Rich just looks absolutely mm. smashed. Um, he looks totally ruined, doesn't he? I was talking to him this I morning, he's, been... and he was he was saying he's just absolutely, you know, totally ruined. He did decide to ride yeah, back think... from Azuria to Marrakesh, though, so it was his own <laughs> fault. <laughs> yeah, I think we I know him well enough to uh, speak the truth that he, you put it well, Josh. He looks like he's just put himself through those uh, one of those aging apps where you <laughs> yeah. add twenty years, but actually he's just spent four or five days in Morocco. Yeah. And, and from my own personal experience, I mean, I lost so much weight last year in, in the race um, because you just don't, you just can't get like the energy in. It's, it's almost impossible. Mm. I mean, even if you stop and get a tangine, that, that, that there's not that much, you know, it's not like you get loads of carbs. It's a load of vegetables and some meat and bread. And you're basically living off yeah. bread and little cakes and things. So you're basically just burning through your reserves the whole time. And, you know, it, I mean, I was super skinny when I came back and Rich looks like he's just, you know, he looks almost gaunt. Um, mm. And I'm sure everyone has been in a very similar situation throughout the race. But I would say that probably also is the fault of um, of the jersey that he was wearing. It looked pretty weared out. So probably worn out. Sorry. So probably it's also that we need actually to talk with this uh, personal stylish. So the next time when he crosses the finish line, <laughs> he can wear something different. Still bright. But yeah. Different. I can give him something. I, I, I don't think he really cared by that point. <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> he didn't he care only... when he started. <laughs> well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Another thing that actually I really like talking about <clears throat> social media, I don't know if you have it there in uh, your screen uh, kind of catching or in your tabs. It's actually, there is a photo and it's actually on the Atlas Monterey's account. And you can see clearly a cargo uh, beep. And as I remember, he has, I think he's Justinus with inside, uh, yeah, if you're going for a chocolate or next, next. Oh, it's yes. one of these, number five. these reels you don't like. <laughs> ah, yes, his walkers. Yeah. It's exactly. Justinus is buns. Uh, it, it's, I think it's Justinus. I don't know if it's super good because then it could eat something that is probably has some proteins inside. I would not say tasty, but different taste. Or it's just gross because it's placed exactly on top of his bun. There, there, there is a funny story about the, this actually. So Justinus went to Burger King and brought two Whoppers before the start. So he had something to eat during the first day. Um, however, one of them fell out on the first climb and he didn't realize. And another rider found it uh, like, a, you know, 10 minutes later and picked it up and ate it. <laughs> <laughs> no way. It's like when your your mates, your schoolmates are just stealing your uh, your food and your breakfast or whatever when you're at school. It's just come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, also while we're on this 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 slidey reel, which I know Becky will be uh, very upset that I'm sliding through. Oh, this climb here, I believe God. this is the the final big big climb on the new section. Call it the the Stelvio of Morocco. There's some ridiculous amount of hairpins. And even the fastest riders were taking over an hour to ride up this road climb. Um, wow! So it's a bit of a, a bit of a kick in the teeth at the end there. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, people. Give me just one second. Maybe the only thing the person that can talk at the moment is basically Josh. I need to switch on the light because I look like in a cave. Give me one second. Well, in that case, uh, while while um, Stefano is uh, sorting himself out, we'll show you this little video uh, from Luisa's. Real. I think this is essentially a summary of, of her Atlas Mountain race through um, through her phone. 
Um, yeah. I mean, it looks incredible. It looks super good. It cold, not pictured good. though. That's, yeah. This is Colonial Colonial Road, which is just horrible to ride on. Just rough and you know rocky. This is one of the very few green areas that um, Becky pointed out, and uh, you get stuff like camels. So, and this will be the finish, I guess. And exactly, you can uh, see the beer here. That, uh, there's Nelson's mum with the beer. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, oh, it's pretty cool to see, isn't it? Really. Yeah, I mean, it's super cool. And the thing that I like a lot is actually, I don't know, maybe you have, for sure, you have more experience than I have, for sure, uh, Josh. But how could you just think about having the time of taking out the phone from your pocket and start making videos? And then at the end of a, such a beating up and such a hard race, sit there a few minutes at least on front of your phone and making a reel. I mean, it's super beautiful, but I mean, big, big kudos also to Luisa to make out a video during the race and then a video after it. Well, well so it could be argued that some people just go on the race to do things like that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Shots fired, Josh. Woof. I know, I know. But actually, I mean, it's funny you should say, because obviously I was doing this these daily updates and the first few days were really quite hard because everyone was so like, into the race that they weren't posting anything on on social media so it's quite hard you're, you're basically just kind of like speculating as to what happens and it's only later on in the race uh, and afterwards in some cases that you, you end up getting a clearer picture of what actually happened because all these kind of little phone images and, and videos start coming to light and uh, i guess that's the exciting thing about dot watching isn't it you don't really know what's going on and even if someone like myself or becky pretending to be an expert we're still making up as we go along <laughs> Expert, spe ex expert speculation josh that's what it is exactly but that's mm. the reason why i love to listen to you and actually to read what you're writing people because that's the thing i can only imagine this kind of thing at the end of the day you are imaging it and also put it into content and context and that's amazing so thanks a lot for doing it again <laughs> but maybe i just want to really go into the the last point that i actually that is there and um so you were talking actually, um, Josh, about there are people that are going out in this kind of event just for doing stories and videos and whatever. That's the reason why I miss Sofian so much, people. I mean, having these stories during the day when he doesn't sleep for days and they actually stick out the phone, stick out the phone from his pocket and start singing, I just call to say I love you. How much is missed? I mean, that's something that changed a bit the, the rules of the game. It's not only having beaten faces and super tired faces on top of mountains and full of uh, dust and stuff but it's also something like taking out the phone making comments talking about stuff and i, well, mean, I think that, that that's the interesting i remember thing about hearing this. about as i say, i remember hearing about how michael raced uh, almost without a phone when he did his record attempt on the tour divide and that's a long way from sofiane interacting with people while he's racing taking videos yeah and i think it's important i mean i'm talking from a sponsored rider's point of view now that race results on a sheet are really boring the reason sofia and obviously he's really good at what he does but the, the reason people like him so much it's not because he's winning these races it's because he's winning these races in a certain style and he's got a character and, and people kind of you know buy into characters and you know it's so they can relate to him a bit more um so i think that's really really interesting and like i mean for example people like justinus he's got a great he's a really nice guy and a great character and i think that's worth a lot um you know if you are trying to make something out of out of it as a you know get sponsorship and things like that it's, it's not just about reeling off a list of results it's, it's not the world tour it's uh there's more to it than that and, and that's also yeah. why people other people can just you know not not feature in the results or even the, the top half of the field and they, they can still um but they're interesting people and they're doing something cool and interesting and you know people can get a lot of um support um you know from well sponsors and just general dot watchers and people because because they are nice people and interesting and i think it counts for a lot absolutely absolutely no that's uh, that's super nice and actually if i can tell you something from a podcasting perspective and actually from time to time uh, writing perspective it's super cool to have actually these characters that can really focus on so many cool details while they're riding the bike so still having kind of an angle of things that it's funny is it's i mean it's cool to listen it is cool to tell and then it's cool actually to report so i mean by sofian saying of course probably the 
the person that is a bit more visible doing that. But also on the other side, there are so many nice characters that are coming to you. They're telling nice stories. Say, Alan Shaw is another one of those. Jenny Tuff is another one of those, for example, coming to mm -hmm. you and telling you so many cool stories and having the time to put also some content out together and makes you really understand how different this sport is from World Tour. And it's yes. so refreshing. I would probably we, argue we that those mid-pack stories are more um, more interesting and more relevant to the vast majority of people. Yeah, we feel the same at Dot Watcher. We rely a lot on the information that the riders put out, be that on social media or something like MTB Cast on the Tour Divide and the trail races in the US. Um, and we're always so grateful to those people who do take the time um, to kind of tell their little stories and perspectives from the race because the stories we tell about the race are just a tapestry of all of the individual stories, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I have so much admiration for people who take the time um, to put out a video or a call in. Absolutely. No, that's that's super great. And actually, that's why we are talking about that, right? I mean, that's the cool stories. We want to talk and then Fadia would link actually this last thought that I'm going to have uh, to the thing, the topic that we were talking before and is the adventure. These people are people that are not just going out for winning, but actually for living the adventure. And probably we need to think a bit more about the word adventure every time that we are mm. commenting and probably that we are going to write, write, sorry, write an event like this. Still keep in mind that it's not a journey. It's, of course, it's a journey. It's not a trip. It's not a holiday. And it's not 100% a race or everything like that. It's an adventure with all the variables that are in the middle, but also all the rewards that are in the middle. The two cents of, final, of yes. philosophy by Stefano. Well, I think uh, I think you're bang <laughs> on because I think a lot of these these are a lot of these things are called races, but actually, it's just an excuse for an adventure, isn't it? Because there's only one person that's actually going to win the race, and if you're mm. going in expecting to win, certainly nowadays, then there's a fairly high percentage chance you're going to get disappointed. So if you're not having a good adventure, then you know you're almost kind of wasting your time, aren't you? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it's too hard. It's too hard to put yourself through that just for the sake of a result or a win you've got to enjoy doing it otherwise i mean <laughs> otherwise you're just uh punishing yourself aren't you yeah just look at the yeah. phone of rich absolutely absolutely <laughs> no there are a lot of things that can be actually reported and tell and told and if I had to be completely sincere, that's why I'm missing so much doing these, um, doing um, podcasts and live podcasts, live as much as they can be a live podcast into the races, because this probably this is one of the ways that you can really take out all the real part, because you're really putting physically microphone into the face of the people and they don't have to think about, okay, I need to make a story, whatever, they have to talk by themselves or whatever, they just need somebody to be there and to talk with there and then you have stories I remember. Uh, do remember his name, but one guy told me that he was actually camping, finding shelter in uh, an abandoned house, Atlas Monte Reyes, 2020. Uh, and actually, at a certain point, one of the ministry of whatever of Morocco just arrived in because it was his property and they saw him inside. They want to talk with him because they didn't know about the event happening there. And they offered him biscuits and, uh, and tea. You know, these stories are the ones that people need to know, not only the thing. Yeah. That, okay, I had a crash and then I had to scratch. Yeah. Yeah, the bike racing side of it is actually quite boring, to be honest. Oh, it's, it's, the things you always remember are, are always those, those random <laughs> stories. Even as a rider, you know, it's, it's much more more interesting kind of, you know, recounting stories to your mates of this weird thing that happened at five in the morning rather than, or I came like seventh place and it took me X amount of days. Yeah. 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 Perfect, people. Probably we can wrap it. Do we have anything else to mm. say? what's what's the next podcast guys we can say it's live i don't know we have a list i think uh, here and there but probably i don't know uh, on top of my head probably i don't know what's coming next on first but probably uh ht550 can be the next one or the the new mountain race Hellenic mountain race can be there right oh yes Hellenic would be good to yes. cover so that's another one of, of nelson's races isn't it so it's bound to be a good one yeah. and i think there's a, a fairly substantial field um marin's going sofian's going i think some of the guys who featured Ooh. in last year's um atlas um are going i'm not so sure on the women's side of things if i'm honest um, i've not yeah. seen an official yeah. start sheet um but just rumor and hearsay there, there's going to be some real exciting mm -hmm. races this year um i mean there's um 
HT 550 is looking fairly stacked. Um, Oh my god, it looks so good, Josh. Fairly stacked is an understatement. <laughs> it is packed to the rafters. Yeah, it's got every men's name. Men's and women's as well. Every name you could hope for. It is so exciting. Yeah, and Tour Divide. <sighs> um, rumor has it Justinus is going and Ulrich's going. No way! Wow. <laughs> so that'd be interesting. Wow. And Absolutely. I did hear Neil might be going as well, Bledchenko, or however, however you pronounce his name. You'll have to connect, yeah. correct me on that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and obviously Gail. Gail for the win. Gail. It's a race that, that yeah, it's a race that definitely, um, you know, favours good snacking skills. Yeah, yeah. She is the queen. She's the queen of snacks. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we've got TCR. I mean, that race just keeps throwing up faster and faster people, so... I think we need to talk about that. I mean, I think that actually there we deserve. I've never talked in my life about TCR, so probably this could be actually my my debut on talking about TCR. Don't worry, Stefano. Josh has plenty of times. Yeah, that's what I can talk about at the moment. <laughs> He's so made a career look, out of it, you might say. <laughs> it's not looking like they're going to win anything else nowadays, is it? So I have to. <laughs> 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 Back in the days of rim breaks. <laughs> well, when I did my first TCR, I was on rim breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the story already, already. Oh All right, gosh. well, let, let's not ruin the, the TCR podcast now. Exactly, let's, exactly. That can be so, a teaser uh, yes. for everyone to get to uh, to get excited for, <laughs> for July or August, whenever it is. Yeah, but actually, yes. probably we need at a certain point try to maybe we can sit down together and record also this conversation because there are going to be a lot of super cool new races. By the way, a little advertising here. We have no sponsor, but we have people that we like. I'm on .watcher.cc, and it says there is this article that is written .watcher dozen, and there are mm. all the new races and old races that actually .watchers are going to actually enjoy uh, follow it. And there is this kind of new trend of events like the unknown race that I like the concept, and there is another one that is at last lost, more or less on the same yes. context, uh, on the same... Um, Yes, on the same page, and this is something that probably are gonna be fun to to race. And another thing uh, to see to race and to watch. Another one that is quite new that I would love to see how and how is going on and how it's gonna be is called Ascend Armenia, and this yes. looks like another one that could be interesting to follow. Yeah. I don't know who I, is gonna take part to it, but I think JP is involved um, in wrecking. I think he's going. Um, I've not I've not seen a start list, but uh, I think it's it's a fairly traditional race. But obviously, Armenia is a you know a new new country and probably a new culture for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, there are some difficulties in the area, um, so hopefully they don't affect the race. Um, but yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Um, there's Justinus's new race, the Bright Midnight, which would be interesting. That's true. Yes. That's true. That's another one. I mean, I, you know me. I'm not a racer. I would probably die in the first 100 kilometers. But that's something that actually really light up a bit of. Uh, well, the interesting thing here. is, it probably won't be dark, which is exactly, a, a exactly. slightly. And, yeah. Yeah. So that'd be cool. Um, and yeah, I'm basically still a kid, that kid that is kind of scared of the dark. So in general, in life, especially when the light doesn't go through and uh, yeah but it could be it's going to be super interesting and i think bruno the guy that actually invented the seven serpents who was also organizer i think it's going to be nice mm. the, the other yes. um slightly interesting format this year is evolution gravel in um tanzania mm. which, yeah. which which was a stage race last year it was a four five day stage race i think marin did it and uh i think sule won it mateo was uh matia Mattia, Mattia, Mattia. Yeah. Um, Lachlan was there, but but this year they're they're running it um, the same course. So it was five stages, and it was, I think it was about two hundred k a day, so a, a thousand on k. But they're running it now this year as two stages, so it's kind of like an ultra, but it's like a two stage ultra, and you have to stop for twelve hours at the camp in the middle. So you start um, uh, at the base of Kilimanjaro or the base camp there. And then you race to the to the, mm -hmm. the 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 camp halfway, and then you have to stop for twelve hours. So if you arrive at say one p.m., you can then start at one a.m. And if the rider the, the next rider finishes at like ten past one, they then have to start, or they can then start ten minutes after you, twelve hours later. So that's an interesting format as well, which might be quite interesting to to keep an eye on. 
but this is kind of a furtherization of races because I think with the curfew that uh, the further Pyrenees is more or less the same. Or, oh no, you just there probably you just need to stop for the night because it's too risky, and then you start you start again tomorrow. You have just stop times. Yeah. It's not involved any place in the middle. Well, I think Camille just likes that just to stir things up a little bit. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think there are a lot of things actually. There are a lot of things. I was actually writing an email last time talking about photography and stuff, and I was actually taking Camille as example for showing this other person taking photos. That's another story, Camille. If you're listening to that, I was mentioning you like a great photographer as usual. Um, anyways, if you want to know more, actually, or let's start with that because I mean, probably it's better. If you have any race that you think that we need to cover in our experimental podcast, but still super funny, at least for me doing, and I hope for you as well listening, and also for the other, for my other mates here also of, uh, speaking together with me, just let us know. The comments below, wherever it is, if it's on the podcast, on the YouTube, it's going to be welcoming you. And also on the other side, if you want to know more, probably it's time to um, subscribe and do all the other things that are going to be helpful. But I would say that you're going to know by our social media, not like today that I didn't write anything uh, but actually you're gonna know by our social media if it's gonna be a new episode it's gonna be a live if it's gonna be this kind of format only video you are gonna know it let us know as well what you prefer I think it's it probably this nobody everybody lost his words also because I think that Becky just crashed completely the internet now uh, yeah I think Becky's internet's finally given up so that's yes. probably our, our key to yeah. end isn't it <laughs> Becky are you still there Yes, yeah, sorry guys. I am here and I can hear you, but I don't know if you could hear me. So we can hear you. Is that just that you are frozen in okay. a super focus? We, we we can hear you and everyone watching on YouTube is gonna be very entertained by the um the page you're pulling on your frozen screen. <laughs> 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 so we should probably end it oh, there. No. <laughs> <laughs> cool people then. Thanks a lot for making okay. this happen together with me. First of all, thanks to the two of you. It was super cool. And thanks a lot also, Becky, for putting together a good plan for the uh, for the episode today. I think that we didn't do for the first episode. Thanks a lot also, Josh, to be here and to drop all your um, experience here in this podcast. Let's put it like that. Uh, let's put it in this way. And I can't wait actually to hear all your experience about the TCR in the next podcast that we're going <laughs> to record here together. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll save up my stories for you especially i can't wait yes. i can't i'll see wait. if i can make up some new ones <laughs> you've heard the old, heard the old ones too many times <laughs> cool people i'm pushing the red button at the moment because here is going too far thanks a lot for tuning in and let me say it let me just try and stop stop recording <laughs>